Hello everyone, welcome to the studio. It's time for another demo and today I'm going to do something that you have requested. Well, my Patreon group that is, because in my group we have a new segment that I'm calling How Would You Paint This? And I'm asking you to tell me what would you like to see me paint? It might be something you're struggling with, it might be something that you've always wanted to paint but you weren't sure how to approach it, and I'll show you how I would approach that same subject. So I thought one of the suggestions would be really good for a video today and kind of timely because the, the artist wanted to know how would I paint a winter landscape that had no interest. In other words, it had no snow because we've been painting a lot of winter landscapes and it's fun to paint snow. But what about those drab winter landscapes that seem colorless, that everything is dead or dried? How would you make that into an interesting painting? Well, that's what I'm going to show you today. We are going to take drab and make it fab, hopefully. We're going to, I'm going to share with you some tips to help a, a kind of a dull, colorless looking painting and find ways to make it more interesting. So come on closer to the easel and we'll get started right away. Alright, here we are. I want to talk about the reference photo and the materials that I'm going to be using before I get started. First of all, here's our reference photo. It is uh, from a uh, prairie garden park that they just let the, the stuff dry and then they'll mow it down in the spring. So it seems very colorless, that there's no leaves on the trees, there's no snow, there's nothing really interesting except for a bunch of dried weeds. Now, if that's your thing, it's an exciting photo. But I know for many of us, you know, we, we're looking for something a little bit more exciting. Uh, so I want to show you how we can get this painting that kind of looks drab and make it a little bit more interesting, or a lot more interesting. We're going to be working on a piece of UART sanded paper. This is the 400 grit. And you might have noticed that I changed the orientation from the reference photo to, to landscape format. And this is a 9 by 12 uh, inch landscape format. Um, the reason why I did that is it's just easier to see on a video uh, landscape format paintings we can get closer and you can really see my mark making. Um, so I'm taking out my artistic license and I'm changing the format and I think actually it's going to make it a little bit more interesting. I went ahead with a pencil and did the initial drawing so I just drew, drew in the tree. I have it slightly off center and I'm going to remember that I need to have some of this uh, dried grasses and stuff kind of lead us into the painting through this uh, meadow area. There's some distant trees that I've blocked in here and then of course we have our sky. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to approach this and how can I make this a little bit more interesting. And one easy way to make a kind of uh, neutral uh, landscape that, that, that really doesn't seem to have a lot of um, intense color is to start with an intense color. This is a very neutral uh, scene, right? We have a lot of neutrals, a lot of grayed down color. But how can we make that interesting? We might want that mood of the neutral, of the gray grayness of the winter day. But if we underpaint with a bold, intense, maybe unexpected color, those little bits and pieces of that underpainting peeking through when you start adding the neutrals on top will give it a little bit more excitement. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to do an alcohol wash today. Let me see if I can hold this up so you can see. These guys here, these are... Um, pastels made by Jack Richardson. They're hand rolled uh, soft pastels uh, called, I think they're called underpainting blocks. I'll put a link to them in the description so that if you're interested, I believe you can still get them at Dakota. I got them at the last IAPS convention and I only fit, picked a, a few colors. They're very, they're dark and they're intense so they're great uh, size, shape, and consistency for underpainting. So uh, I also have a black art graph um, tailor chalk, uh, which is just basically ink in a block form. And I'm going to start the underpainting by blocking in my tree with this art graph. And you're going to see that it, it takes very little pigment. There's two sections to the trunks on this tree. It's going to take very little pigment to release a, a lot of color once we wet it with the alcohol. We could use alcohol, we could use water. Um, 
I'm going to use rubbing alcohol today. It dries a little bit more quickly, and sometimes you get a little bit more um, interesting effects. What about all of these dried branches? How are we going to approach that without having to draw every single one? Well, what I'm doing is I'm putting a very light application of this pastel, or sorry, this art graph, and when I wet it, you'll see what happens. And then we're going to negatively paint the sky to get the um, illusion of a lot of little tiny branches. All right. While I have this dark black, this black pigment, I'm going to create this zigzag um, suggested pathway. This is going to be underneath all of the grasses. And by having this nice dark pathway in place in the underpainting stage, it's going to really um, create a good foundation for the rest of the painting. All right, now let's have fun with some of these um, pigment blocks. Let's, and I'm, I have no rhyme or reason as to how I'm picking them. They're all pretty much the same dark value. Um, but I think I like this uh, nice red-violet. And here's a nice hot pink. And I'm just kind of infusing this whole bottom section with some bold, unexpected color. Uh, there is a, a, a little bit of a method to my madness, though, because I'm choosing purples, knowing that I'm going to be putting a lot of yellows, golden colors on top. With that being the uh, complement, when those purples peek through all the yellows, it will add a little bit more excitement to the painting. So I'm going to just put a little bit of darkness at the back of the painting. And those trees are in the distance, so I'm actually going to use a blue to help push them back into the distance a little bit. Notice though it's still all the same dark uh, value. Dark and intense. Let's add a little bit of blue to our black area. What about the sky? We could leave the sky alone. I did happen to pull out a um, light value pink. This is a Rembrandt pastel, a nice hard pastel, which does a great job for underpainting because it doesn't fill up the tooth of the paper. Now these Richeson uh, underpainting blocks are, are very soft, but I'm trying to use a light enough touch so that I don't fill the tooth of the paper. All right, next step is to liquefy all of this. I'm going to use a nice stiff bristle brush and I poured a little bit of rubbing alcohol into my cup and I'm going to just simply start with the lightest um, area Ooh. and I'm going to just liquefy this. I'm not going to go up into the tree area yet because remember that's um, going to be black, dark. I don't mind if it runs a little bit because that's going to help give maybe interesting effects, maybe branches. Look at I'm getting a, a tree trunk with my drips. And the interesting thing about this approach is there's no right or wrong way to do an underpainting. Uh, there's no right or wrong choice of colors um, or technique or material. I think in this case I just want something I interesting and colorful to respond to so that it will hopefully help make my painting a little bit more interesting and not quite as dull as our photo. As this alcohol wash dries the alcohol gets absorbed and it will start to drip and create really uh, interesting, unpredictable things. That's one thing I love about an alcohol wash or any kind of wet wash. You really can't plan or predict what's going to happen and that makes it very exciting. What I'm doing here is look at how I'm just kind of tapping the brush so I can kind of get this illusion of bare trees. Sometimes if you really take your time in this underpainting stage, don't rush through it, 
don't I like to say don't be a house painter just really take your time then a lot of times you don't have to do quite as much work with our with your pastel because you have some really interesting things happen I right, know I'm wetting the the branches the bigger the trunks and the bigger branches and then I want to come <clears throat> I don't want my brush too wet this time because I just want to come and very lightly tap the other dark areas. Now what's going to happen is it's it's going to look like the tree is full, right? It's not like bare branches, but we will come back with our sky color and pull out those branches. So we're going to do some negative painting. Let's just pull this over further. All right, so look at I don't know if the camera is picking this up, but we have some really interesting drips going on. This is almost neon over here. So uh, I think this is going to be really exciting. Definitely uh, not drab. So we'll see what happens. We're going to let this dry and then I'll be right back once it's dry and we will start with our pastel layering. All right, I'm back. It probably took about 30 minutes to dry thoroughly, had a lunch break, and now I'm back ready to paint. I want to share with you the pastels that I'm going to be using for the painting. Of course, I'm not going to use every single one of these. And by the way, I typically will choose a, a pre-selected palette that I put in a tray and not work from the box because it's just too many choices. But there are some times when I just all right, I'm too lazy to pick out a palette that I'll work from the box. But I found when I was beginner, um, it was so much easier to to pull out the pastels that I wanted to use for a painting. And I've done videos on that. You can look for that. Um, or join me on Patreon because we talk about that a lot and I show you exactly how I pick out my palette. But I'm going to be using some Terry Ludwig pastels. This is the Floral Landscape set that I curated. I'm going to be using some Rembrandt pastels. This is the 120 half stick set. These are a little bit hard, well they are harder, so I'm going to use them for more detail. And this is the Sennelier half stick uh, Paris collection, I believe, and I'll use those for my final marks. All right, now let's have a look at what happened with this really cool underpainting. And we got all kinds of drips. I like to call these um, spider webs or root systems. And it's perfect for this tangled um, collection of dried grasses that are in this particular landscape. And I, I like the way all the colors dried. You know, this is not the colors, obviously, that we're going to use, but hopefully it will infuse our painting with more interest than just going with the local uh, drab colors that are present in the photo. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and I do this for every painting, is when I approach the, the underpainting, I come with a softer pastel and reinforce all the dark areas. So in this case, it's going to be our tree trunk, or tree, the trunks and the branches, and I'm using a dark blue soft pastel just to reinforce the dark values on the branches and trunk. And I'm only really going to draw with the edge of the largest um, branches. All of those finer ones, I'll show you what I'm going to do with those, but just the larger ones, I'm going to just, I'm drawing them in with the tip of my pastel. Most of them will get covered up. I'm also going to take this dark blue and very lightly go over this dark, um, I call this a foundation pathway. Just going to lead the viewer up through this uh, meadow. But I'm using a light touch because I really like the colors and I also love the drips that I got. So I don't want to press too hard and cover everything up too quickly. All right, now we want to make this a little bit more exciting, right? Not just, not drab. So I'm gonna add some purple up into our trees. So using a layer of a dark value purple, I'm gonna just go right on top of the blue. And I'm using the side of the pastel this time and a very, very light touch just to kind of scumble over some purple because we're going to give the illusion of those bare branches without having to paint every single branch. I'm going to take that purple and pull it down into my dark area. So I'm reinforcing the dark, but I don't want to cover everything up, so I have to use a very light touch. 
All right, that's two layers of dark. I think I'm going to go for one more layer of dark. Let's use another purple, but this one, that was more of a red violet. Here's a little bit more of a blue violet. And I'm going to use it at the, at the base of these distant trees because it's a little bit of a cooler color. Well, it works better for the distance. I'm just going to put a little bit of it down below. What about in the tree? We could put a little bit of that in, in the tree. Remember, what do we want? We want interest, not boring, not dull color. Okay, so we've got enough darks, I think. I'm going to, before I move away from the darks, I'm going to take the uh, Terry Ludwig eggplant, which is, I call this the super dark. Look at how dark that is. And in areas where I think it's d darker than anywhere else, such as like the base of these trees, at the base uh, where the grasses will come up over this area because really we want to we want to ground the tree we don't want the tree to look like it's floating and then way down here at the foreground I'm gonna add I'm gonna just connect these dark areas I'm gonna add this what I call super dark it's much easier to put in the darks er early on in the painting than to try to come back and, and um, put them in at the end now before I go any further, I'm going to take a um, Rembrandt, this is a black, and using the sharper top edge, I'm going to just make some very nice broken lines just for some of those uh, smaller branches, those twiggy, twiggy bits and pieces. I'm doing this now because once I start putting in the sky, I'm going to want to carve into these spaces, so I really want to establish where these branches are. And one thing that I'm not doing is I'm not really paying uh, extremely close attention to what's happening in the tree, in the photograph, right? I have my basic tree in place and I, I just, I'll glance at it every so often just so that I can kind of get the feeling of the way the some of the branches go, the more interesting ones. But I would drive myself completely crazy if I was trying to copy these branches exactly the way they are. I'm not really a photorealistic painter and so that just goes against my grain. Uh, I, I do want the tree to go off the page because I really have... Uh, condensed it quite a bit and you know it really is it really belongs way up this high but we have kind of a crop view so we're going to make sure some of those larger branches go off all right now one more thing and then we're going to move on to um, the sky so what I want to do is I want to add a very light haze of color of a dull color so now we're going to start to introduce some of those neutrals this is a grayed down violet and I'm just putting this gray down violet, just a little, I call it a hush, because it's such a very light touch. Um, and I'm going to come in and peek, pu push the sky into these areas, and this very light touch of, a, of this gray down purple is going to act as kind of an illusion of those thin branches. Before I do that, though, I really want to establish what's happening in the distance so that way I know how far down my sky is going to go. And I, um, I want them to look like they're further back. So I'm going to use a cool grayed down blue just to really push this, um, push those bushes or treetops, whatever they are, into the distance. And I use a super light touch so that the purple that I already put down and the blue from the underpainting is peeking through. And also you notice these little marks right here? That's actually from the brush marks of that wet pastel that I put down. So I'm going to leave those alone. I like those marks. All right, let's talk about what we're going to do for the sky color. Okay, we know that we're going to have a lot of these golden... Um, orangey yellowy grasses and <clears throat> what's happening in the sky do, you know do we want it to look like it's an overcast 
day. I mean, in the photo, it's white. It's blown out. So we have the artistic license to put in the color we want, but we want it to talk to what's happening on the ground. We don't want it to look like it's a completely different day. Um, and so you really want to think through the color that you put in. It's I could put a color in and then make a change, so it's, I'm not really tied to it. I do like the pink, because the pink talks to the, the uh, pinks and purples in the ground, but I know I'm going to be putting yellow up there, so what, what if I added a layer of yellow? Again, I can come and cover this up if I feel like it's too yellowy. And I'm going to use it to kind of, kind of like a carving tool, right? I'm taking that yellow and making marks inside the tree. Now, normally I would say when you're trying to do sky holes or these bare branches, you could squint at your tree and then those spaces would pop out and you'd see where they are. However, I did not follow what was happening in the photo. So if I now try to to uh, squint and and replicate the spacing that I see in my photo, it really wouldn't be accurate. So what I have to do is look at the branches that I have established and, and usually your sky hole comes alongside of the branches. Um, I don't want my sky holes to be all the same shape and size, so I'm trying to vary things. And then you don't, also don't want it to look like polka dots, which it's looking like polka dots right now, but we're gonna have to come back over it with another layer. I'm using a lighter value of, the, of a pale yellow because it gets a little bit lighter at the horizon. An interesting thing is happening, and I might, it seems like there's a little bit of that yellow glow down here at the horizon. Um, so I'm going to use the darker color right down in there. I might change that. Okay, so what is happening right now? Well, we have a highly spotty tree right at this moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of my workable fixative, which I have handy right over there and I'm going to give it a quick spray. I'll tell you what it is in just a second. Um, normally I'm going to, oh yeah, see I have a problem with, this is a can, this is a Blair very low workable fixative and it had a plug top and I guess we didn't completely fix it because when I spray I'm getting all these dots. Well, in this case I really like the dots uh, but imagine if you didn't want dots. I, I showed it already. If I didn't want dots, it really would be uh, distressing. But in this case, I like the texture of it. Um, but why did I spray it? I really wanted to fix these dark areas because what I'm going to do now is come back over it with, let's see, we want it to be a light, cool, dull color. I'm going to just use this gray-blue. And what, and what this will do is going to cover up some of those sky holes so they're not so obvious. Okay. We don't want them to be jumping out. So now they're buried just a little bit. The next thing that I need to do is come back and reinforce some of those branches. So to do these bare branches and to have them not look like uh, you have gone and drawn every single um, branch and twig, it's a multi-step uh, process. You put them in, you add like a haze of color, you put in some sky holes, and then you're going to come back with your dark and redraw some of those branches. And I'm going to come back and refine that a little bit more, but I want to I move on from this area. I have a double branch right there. Now let's address this area right in here. We've got this uh, really kind of drab, drably colored area, but we've punched it up with our underpainting, so let's continue with that and see if we can't maintain the, the interest. This is a darker, uh, 
kind of a brick red color. Just reinforce those darker areas before I move on to the to the lighter areas. Now, we have right now before I go into the grasses, I have almost I call this almost like a snake. It's this blue bit area and it seems too it seems too flat. So I need to have some of those bushes come forward and some of them go back in space. So I need to change it up just a little bit more. So I think I'm going to take, let's see, maybe some of that purple, add a bush in the front. Now you see how I put this red violet right here and then we still left the blue, blue gray back in the distance. That helps. I'm going to push it back a little bit more. That helps me give a little more layering, right? It's not just a flat layer of blue. So that was just a little device to help me give more depth. Now I need to come back in here and add some of these colors, these grayed down colors. I'm going to start with a little bit of a, a red-orange and I'm using a light touch because the light touch allows me to maintain some of these bright colors underneath. So here I'm coming in with the yellow ochre. And I need to start to pull this color on top of the darker area. So I want the dark to be there, but I don't want it to be, um, I don't want you to be looking at a big dark hole. So I'm covering it up. Um, I do need the other fixative that's not anything. Hopefully this will work. I'm going to spray it again, and by the way, when I uh, use the workable fixative, I normally use it outside. Right, so even though it's low, very low odor, I'll use it outside um, when I'm here working by myself. But for the sake of the video, I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to change the sizes of some of these distant tree shapes. I felt like they were still too much the same while we let this, this fixative dry. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the Sennelier pastels because I have a little bit more of a selection of the dull grayed down colors in this particular set. And we really need to have these dull colors uh, because that's the type of day it is, right? It's a, a winter day without snow. We want to punch it up, but we still need to have these neutrals. And this set has a lot of those nice neutrals. So I'm using a kind of a, a yellow ochre. Here's a grayed down green. Yeah, there's not really green in the scene, but I, I think it's going to just help um, give a little bit more color. Remember, we want to we don't want it to look as drab as it necessarily does in the photograph. And also, if you were really there in person, you would you would see much more color in these grasses. In the photo, they may look dull and boring, but in real life, there's a lot of color in grasses and dried grasses. I uh, I, uh, <coughs> I see um, I see a lot of purple in them. I'm going to put in another layer of purple. Remember, purple was in the underpainting, but there's no reason why you can't bring it to the to the top layer. That's a, a, a really good device to use. Is um, Some of these are harder than others. Is to take the colors you have in your underpainting and pull them to the to the uh, to the top layers. Now one thing that I am going to try to do is the areas that are really interesting, like these drips over here and this really bright pink over here, I'm not going to cover that up because I, and here this little bit of hot pink in there, that's in the underpainting. I really want that to peek through and allow this to be much more interesting. Um, now, if you're asking why did I um, spray the workable fixative, well, the workable fixative 
fixes these colors in place um, and then allows me to come back with more layers and when it goes over the fixed areas it kind of skips over lets the dark stay dark um, and I get a, a bit of a texture effect so, so I'm I'll spray it multiple times as I'm building up the layers in these kind of uh, areas now oftentimes after I spray it, it takes just a minute to dry and that's when I'll come in and, and um, work on the tree a little bit more. <clears throat> I'm taking now a Rembrandt pastel which is much harder and using the tip and just kind of uh, rolling the tip so that I can get kind of a broken line and that broken line looks more natural than if I drew it with a stiff line. Stiff drawn lines don't always look as natural or as painterly. So I'm just going to put in a few of those with that harder pastel. Alright, now this is getting dry, so I'm going to gradually, well I like to say turn on the lights, meaning introduce um, a little bit of brighter color. So I like that one clump of golden weeds right in there. I like how they come up from the bottom. I'm not putting in single blades of grass or little detail on the uh, flowers yet, but I will. It's just a matter of building up the layers. So I'm using the side of the pastel at this point to get enough layers in place. Still keeping a light enough touch so that I have um, those pretty underpainting colors. So I'm trying to have an upward thrust towards the tree with my marks, right? So I'm having my grasses kind of be blowing in the wind, pulling the eye up to the tree. I think I've got enough wide marks right now so now I want to come in and do some um, finer um, thinner marks and also I, what I like when I paint these grassy areas is to have a variety of thicknesses so if I use these super soft pastels this these Sennelliers I can really just press down and get nice thick like impasto like marks almost as if I, would, I had thicker paint um, and it makes a nice contrast to all of these thinner marks so I'll make a few of those there's a little bit lighter now this lighter this yellow is like the yellow that's up in the sky I think it might be too yeah, it's a little bit too white I'm going to cover those up what happens if you get too many marks too much too much of the same you can scrape away, right? So I take, this is a bamboo skewer, and I'm using it to scrape through those thicker areas. And this helps me give that texture to the grass. All right. Let's come in with a, a, a Rembrandt, a little bit harder. This is this is a better color. That was, other one was a little bit too light, too pasty looking. And this is where you can look at the photo and it kind of gives you an idea of the types of grasses that are growing. Uh, you want some that are bent, you want some that are going out the, in the opposite direction. You know, your rogue grass. But there's no right or wrong way to do this. Just have fun with mark making. This is this is like the joyful part of painting. You've built up all the layers. Now you can have fun adding those details, those finer bits and pieces of grass. I also like some of those really dark uh, bits that are right in here. There's like um, I don't know if I like that color. There's like a dried flowers. Yeah. So I want to put a few really dark marks to represent some of those little 
dried bits and pieces. Now, I'm at the point of, of the painting where typically if I'm home, you know, in the studio and I'm painting on my own, I, I would take a break and put up a mat around it and step back so that I could have a better idea of what's happening. Because if I keep painting and I'm not really th being thoughtful about where I make my marks and where I put the marks, I'm going to end up with way more than I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step back, put the mat on, and then I'll come back and we'll finish the painting. All right, I got my magic frame, magic mat. I'm just holding it up there so that I can evaluate the painting. Really, what was my goal? Was uh, drab to fab, right? I wanted to take something that was like boring colors and punch it up, but still make it kind of fit the mood. Um, so I like what's happening. I think when I take this away, everything's too concentrated here. So I do need to add a little bit of grass uh, color here. I need to use a little bit more sky to break up, especially in this area here. And right in this area is a little bit um, ambiguous. I think I need a few more marks over on this. Maybe define this just a little bit more so that there's a little bit of balance in that area. But I'm going to do just a few things and then I'll stop again. That's, that's the best way to uh, do a finish is make a few marks right and then step back and by the way I go over this process in detail um, over on my patreon group we do a paint along painting every month and we go through this process of um, slowing down at the end of a painting and talking about what to look for and how to resolve a painting so I'd love for you to join us if if you are not already a member of the group all right, so I added a little bit more. I think that helps. Again, I don't want to get too carried away because I love the color underneath. So if I, if I make too many marks, I'm going to lose that. I'm going to cover it up. How many times have you done a really cool underpainting and then you just you just didn't stop in time and then you, you before you knew it, you had uh, completely covered up your underpainting? I mean, it's not the end of the world, but it is sometimes helpful to slow down at the end of a painting. Make a mark, step back. Make a mark, step back. Allow yourself, sometimes I say, allow yourself three marks and then step back when you get to this point. So I'm adding in some grayed down violet. Because this area in here got a little bit too thick. Again, I could scrape away. That is helpful. Draw with your bamboo skewer to get some interesting grass marks. Especially right up in this area here. Another thing you can do is, again, introduce some of the colors that are in the underpainting. So make some marks of, of purple. And if you say, well, I don't think those grasses, those dried grasses are purple like that. The uh, whole idea is that you are an artist, right? Not a camera. And if you want to infuse your painting with more color than you actually see, you, you, have, the, uh, um, you have the license to do that. So just a few more of those little bits and pieces of grass. And now we need to come in and uh, define our tree just a little bit more. Now we talked about, or I talked about, did I really want to leave the color of the sky yellow? Uh, what other choices would I have? I could make the sky violet. I could really make the sky a lot lighter. You know, I have it pretty yellow. Um, I'm just giving a very light dusting just to give it a little bit more of a feeling of um, laciness. So again, you have to kind of come back and forth. Put some in, take some out. Put some in, take some out. And then I did think I wanted to pull out this 
tree shape a little bit more, this purple one. So I'm just going to do some negative painting and define that shape a little bit, soften it. Um, what else did I want to do? Oh, I see something's happening. Really need to slow down at the end of your painting and really look at it because I had made an awkward shape. So you don't want your shapes to look... Um, strange looking. I'm going to add a little bit of a lighter yellow down here. And I'm going to step back. I think I'm going to come in. I really like that purple mark. I'm going to add a little bit of a red-violet up into the tree just to help pull your eye up into the tree and give some little eye candy up there. When you get up there, there's something interesting to look at. Um, you could spend a lot of time on your grasses. A lot of times I will spend so much time on the grasses and then when I step away I realized I've done too much. And what is what happens if you've done too much? Sometimes it's not what you add, it's what you take away and you might come in with a stiff brush and remove some of it. I think it's okay. I do think I need to restore a little bit more of the dark. So I'm going to take that dark blue that I used initially and just kind of come in and add back a little bit more of the darker areas in between the grasses. Kind of like the same way we did the, the um, branches. And then come back with a few more fatter grasses. The fat grasses, the grasses that I press and use more pressure so that I get thicker marks will be a contrast to all the other type of marks. So you have much more interest that way. So I think I've done as much as I want to do uh, on this painting. The whole idea, remember, drab to fab. So underpaint with unexpected bold colors and you will really infuse your painting with a lot more interest and you can take a, um, a painting that has duller colors and really punch it up by underpainting with bolder colors. So I hope you've enjoyed the demo. I certainly had fun painting for you. Um, I'd love for you to, to like, comment, subscribe, all those good things. It really does help uh, me grow this channel. And, of course, I invite you to join me on Patreon. I'd love to have you over in our group. And that's it. I will see you next time.